Thank you all for joining us. My name is Sarah Cable and I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Office of Interdisciplinary Programs and the Office of the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. It's my honor to welcome you all to the first session of our eight-part series on interprofessional mindfulness. We will briefly introduce our speaker and then we will begin today's activity. A few housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded. We know not everyone could join us and we want to make sure the session is available for you to review as you continue your mindfulness practice. The chat is also being recorded and you're welcome to enter notes or questions there. As with any Zoom meeting, we ask that you mute your mic when not speaking. We may mute mics for you as well to prevent any sound feedback during the presentation. Thank you. The seminar series is a result of ongoing research and interest by Dr. Edwin Jerry Ibe. He is Vice Chair, Assistant Professor, and Program Director in the Masters for, Public, uh, for Health Administration in the OU Hudson College of Public Health. Jerry has over 10 years of healthcare experience in multiple roles, organization types, and geographies. Prior to academia, he was a manager of clinical and systems for New York Presbyterian Hospital, where he successfully managed a $20 million grant to help develop information exchanges to facilitate care coordination between the hospital and community-based patient-centered medical homes. Dr. Jerry Ibe has served in a variety of roles for Bon Secours Health System, including as Vice President of Strategy and Philanthropy, leading departments through strategic chains with the role and staff responsibilities spanning multiple states. He now brings his practical experience to the classroom as Vice Chair and Assistant Professor. Jerry received a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Richmond, earning a double major in Leadership Studies and Speech Communication. He also completed a dual graduate degree, receiving an MHA from Virginia Commonwealth University and a JD from the University of Richmond School of Law. And with that, please join me in welcoming our facilitator for today's event, Dr. Jerry Ibe. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. So um, this is going to be uh, an hour long session. It is not going to be an hour long session of me talking. <laughs> it's going to be about half of me talking, but uh, about the other half will be you all talking with one another. Uh, so we may break you into or put you into breakout rooms. Um, so uh, thank you for coming and learning a little bit about interprofessional mindfulness. Um, we have a, a whole series. There's eight sessions total that go throughout this academic year. And if you're able to attend any of the, any of the other sessions, we would love to have you for that. So let's start off with a little poll. I want to see who's here joining us. You can see it now. Okay, so it looks like we have uh, mostly students, which is awesome. Some staff and faculty. And then um, looks like we have graduate college, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, um, and shared service. And then do you have any experience with practicing mindfulness? None. Perfect. This is great. So I hope <laughs> that I don't lead you astray. Um, and for somebody who has previous experience or current practice, again, I hope that what I'm saying vibes with your experience. Um, yeah, so thank you all for uh, joining us and let's move on here. Okay, so we're gonna start off first talking about what is mindfulness. I wanna start by saying that there's actually not really a consensus agreement on what mindfulness is. Um, and that can actually be a good thing for many people having options increases their likelihood to try something out. So mindfulness could be sitting still and trying to observe your thoughts. Uh, it could be a moving meditation, whether you're running or walking or cycling. So mindfulness can be a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, however, that doesn't really help us. We need something to work off of. This is John Kabat-Zinn. Uh, he is an American professor emeritus of medicine and the creator of the Stress Reduction Clinic and the Center for Mindfulness in Medicine, Healthcare, and Society at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. He created a stress reduction program, Mindfulness-Based stress, Re stress Reduction, or MBSR, uh, which is offered by medical centers, hospitals, and health maintenance organizations. John Kabat-Zinn is widely credited with bringing mindfulness from the East here to the West. And this is how he looks at mindfulness. He says, mindfulness is awareness that arises through paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And then sometimes he adds in, in the service of under self-understanding and wisdom. So, Three things I really want to point out from his quote there is mindfulness, uh, in his experience, mindfulness is about awareness, 
It's about present focus and it's about non-judgment. So we're gonna take a couple of those things and modify them a little bit to get to uh, what we're talking about in our series. Um, but it, it's been shown and, and they've used it for healthcare clients and patients uh, for many years now and, and, and particularly his program MBSR has, has been shown to be very effective for alleviating stress. So the question is, well, why mindfulness for healthcare? Uh, I'll share a little bit story with you here. If anyone is not familiar with Dan Harris, um, in 2004, Dan Harris was an ABC News correspondent. He was broadcasting live on Good Morning America and he experienced a panic attack live on air. Um, he credits meditation with helping him work through the anxiety that caused his panic attack. Uh, he went on to write a memoir called 10% Happier about his experiences with meditation. And he talks about this uh, in his podcast, which is called 10% Happier. Uh, he, he has um, said that in his opinion, he believes meditation and mindfulness are the next great public health revolution. So just like in the 70s and 80s, if you saw somebody running, you would probably be concerned for them. And you would think, well, what's wrong? Why are you running randomly in the street? Because nobody really ran or really exercised consistently back then. Uh, now it's, it's considered not only normal, but encouraged for us to move and to you know, get those health benefits from exercising. He thinks we're gonna see the same thing with meditation, mindfulness, and related practices that not only will they be, um, seen as okay and appropriate, but they will be encouraged, uh, not just for personal care, uh, but as we'll talk about throughout the series, but for helping healthcare teams, healthcare systems. So Dan Harris has a great vision for um, meditation mindfulness for public health, uh, but I wanna talk about how it can maybe apply for uh, the healthcare delivery system. So the Triple AIM is a very common framework that's utilized in healthcare. Uh, this is a framework developed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement that describes an approach to optimizing health system performance. Uh, it's IHI, Institute for Healthcare Improvements. It's their belief that new designs uh, should be developed that simultaneously pursue these three dimensions of the triple AIM. So improving the patient experience of care, which includes quality and satisfaction, improving the health of populations, and reducing their per capita healthcare costs. So this all sounds great. Um, you know, I don't think anybody would argue that we want to do these three things. These three things are good. They're, uh, they're good for patients. They're good for the healthcare system. The challenge is that doing these three things can also cause a lot of stress. Uh, there were some authors, some doctors who wrote uh, a couple of authors, and they talked about how burnout and physician well-being is, is a, a major impediment of achieving, of achieving the triple aim. And uh, you know, they said, in essence, what's happening is we're trying to do the things that we need to do to achieve this triple aim, and it's burning us out. It's stressing us out, and we're, we're leaving healthcare. You're actually getting rid of the people who are trying to do these things because the healthcare system is, is harming them. And so uh, this is a very famous quote from Florence Nightingale, and it says, it, it may seem a strange principle to enunciate as the very first requirement in a hospital that it should do the sick no harm. Uh, of course, she was talking about patients and nurses and other caregivers not hurting patients. Um, but my argument is that we can expand this view and talk about uh, not harming the caregivers. And so maybe one of the very first priorities of hospitals and other healthcare delivery systems is that they should first seek to do no harm for the caregivers. Um, and then for you personally, what I would encourage you to do is take the same approach as your first approach is not to harm yourself and not to harm your fellow caregivers. And that's really what this series is all about. How can we help take care of ourselves and take care of one another? So that these authors who wrote this, these articles talked about this concept of a missing aim. And this is often referred to now as the quadruple aim. So the quadruple aim is not officially recognized by the Institute for Healthcare Impro Improvement as their triple aim, or they haven't dropped the triple aim to embrace the quadruple aim, but many people today talk about this quadruple aim. And that's this fourth component, which is the improved clinician experience, um, or more easily just said, uh, care for the caregivers. So 
While meditation and mindfulness may be very well be the next great public health revolution, as Dan Harris predicts, I think it could also be a great revolution for the healthcare delivery system. Um, and as we care for our clinicians, we're caring for ourselves and we're caring for others. So let's go to a breakout session. Okay, so if anyone feels comfortable, we don't have to, but if you feel comfortable and you would like to share any, any of your um, discussions, please feel free to do so now. Well, I'll share. Okay. Um, Tramel and I were in a breakout room and we talked about how um, self-care activities, how you have to plug them in and they need to be concrete. And even though I'm saying, even though it's not that easy, um, I feel like the more that I continue doing it, you know, to, to plug in when I'm gonna exercise, to make sure that I eat, to take a break, um, different things like that, I feel like the easier it gets. Um, and I, this semester, I'm not working, I'm only going to school, but in previous um, employment positions, I didn't feel like that that self-care was supported. Yeah, well, thank you. I hope I've got Melinda, Melindy. Yeah. Melindy, yeah, thank you oh, for sharing. Sorry. Yeah. I have the advantage of the fact that I am a counselor and I work among counselors. And so we're really um, very much aware of the importance of attending to that self-awareness, watching out for burn, burnout. And, and so thankfully I work among a team that's very supportive and always, we're always asking one another, checking in with one another and, you know, asking about delegator, helping out. Um, I was sharing with a group that I lose more self-awareness probably in the transitions between like counselor Carmen and then mommyhood Carmen who right. <laughs> keeps on working when we get home. Um, but thankfully work doesn't seem where I'm at right now in life to be um, a burden in that way. Well, that's great. Okay, well, let's, let's, um, let's explore a couple of different dynamics. So there's three things that um, I am um, kind of basing this entire series on. And the first one is this mindfulness approach to connecting our minds and our bodies. And so um, this is a very famous um, author and physician, um, healthcare advocate, um, Atul Gawande. Uh, I love this quote from him. He says, look, there's a science in what we do, yes, but also habit, intuition, and you know, sometimes just plain old guessing. Um, so there's really two parts of this uh, mind-body connection. The first is that, you know, really it's all in your head, um, especially here in the West. Uh, we have this kind of upbringing with a Western mindset. And a Western mindset is where you gain most of your understanding and knowledge from induction, meaning rational thinking, you know, you, you, you put one and one, one together and that makes two, things make sense, you break them down, um, you know, we, we kind of take things apart to understand them and then put them back together. This is how we see such specialization in medicine, you know, with people specializing and subspecializing in specific body parts or functions. Uh, the focus on a Western mentality is, is on teaching, and it's also focused on gaining competence. Um, and we, you know, even in my program, we are a competency-based program. So we tell our students, you're not just here to learn health administration generally, you're here to learn some very specific, there was an example, 14 specific competencies that are related to being a, a, an effective healthcare administrator. And so most of our programs are arranged like that. We, we have these competencies that we measure our students' uh, attainment against, and we encourage their development towards these competencies. So that's the thing that's all in your head, you know, this brain part. But in another sense, even though it's all in your head, uh, in another sense, you really have to get out of your head. Um, so in contrast to a Western mindset, there is an Eastern body um, approach or an Eastern somatic approach. And this one, instead of induction being the key to learning, uh, it's experience. It's doing things. Um, it's uh, seeing how they go um, outside of a, a theory. Uh, instead of the focus being on teaching, the focus is on learning. Um, you know, it recognizes that while you may understand something in your mind, um, you really embody it as you do it and as you learn to do it. There's a great quote for any of you who love golf. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, it says, golf cannot be taught, it can only be learned. Um, and so especially for physical things like golf, um, you know, these things, they really just have to, you have to learn them. Um, you can't 
be taught them. And instead of the focus being on competence, my argument is that the, the um, focus in an Eastern body approach is on effectiveness. So even if you don't really understand if something works, if it's working for you, then that's pretty good. So like an example that I have is uh, stretching. There's a lot of research recently that's been shown that there's not a lot of scientific evidence behind stretching and maybe we shouldn't stretch anymore. Uh, but that's a very Western mentality. And the Eastern mentality is saying, you know what, if stretching is working for you and it's not hurting you, why not do it? Um, you may not understand why it works, but that doesn't mean it's not working. All right, so if we take this mind-body approach, um, sometimes people may take that to mean, well then fine, like I, I will think about things with an, an, a Western mind and an Eastern body, great. Um, but I would argue that it's, it's more than that. Uh, besides just being mind-body, what's important is how they relate to one another. And my argument is the body is first. Uh, when it comes to your actions and your behaviors and being mindful, the body should be emphasized before the brain. There's a um, pretty commonly known uh, rule, it's called a rule or approach, it's called 70-20-10. Um, ESPN, as an example, uses the 70-20-10 approach to development. And this means that most employee development 70% happens on the job, while 20% comes from relationships and informal learning, and only 10% comes from formal courses targeted at specific skills. So for you students there in the audience, um, you know, obviously you're learning a lot, you're getting deluged with information, but uh, in the grand scheme of things, it's very likely that all of the things you're learning now will, will serve as a very strong but very small foundation of the, the development that you're going to accrue over time as you get to experience better relationships and more relationships um, and as you get to experience um, things through actual on-the-job training. If anyone's not familiar with this lady, well of course most people are familiar with the top lady, um, uh, Wonder Woman, but the bottom lady is Amy Cuddy. Uh, she is a researcher, um, was at Harvard when she wrote um, or when she conducted some studies about power posing. Um, power posing is kind of this pose that she's doing now, and um, her argument was that a lot of times we feel like our bodies are displaying what's going on in our minds, and she's like, well, can it work in reverse? Can we actually change our bodies to change our minds? And this is the quote that she has, that our bodies do, in fact, they, our bodies change our minds, our minds change our behavior, and our behavior changes our outcomes. And, and she says at the end of her very famous TED Talk, um, you know, many of you have heard this phrase, don't, uh, don't fake it till you make it, or the phrase is fake it till you make it. She says, don't fake it till you make it, fake it till you become it. Because if you, for instance, take on a power pose, you may not feel like doing that power pose, but just doing it, your body changes and then it changes what fires in your brain. And so um, let's go back into our breakout room. So now that we've talked a little bit about mind body, uh, here's my question, just a little bit short of time here. We'll do maybe three minutes in our breakout room. So what do you do? Um, maybe it's not the Wonder Woman pose, but what types of things do you do or have you tried that do affect how you think and how you behave? So it looks like we, we can probably put groups into two groups of four. So let's give that a shot. Let's see. Oh, no, I was, I was hoping somebody was going to come back into the room in a power pose. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Would anyone like to share any of your experience with any uh, either power pose or some sort of body movement to to uh, change your mind and mentality? Okay, well, that's fine. We can go on. We'll go on to the next dynamic. So we talked about mind and body. The next dynamic is causing and allowing. All right, so I have another. You guys can tell I like golf, even though I'm terrible at it. I like golf, so I have another. <laughs> golf um, part here. And this is one of my favorite quotes of all time. Uh, it says at the bottom of the screen here that the swing, the golf swing, the swing is an action in which certain things are caused to happen and certain things are allowed to happen. And faults arise in trying to cause what should be allowed. So certainly, there's a lot of skill involved in hitting a golf ball. Um, you know, professionals will spend hours working on these minute, you know, angles and, and degrees of approach. Um, you know, they will fiddle around with their hand positionings and their foot positionings. I mean, there's so much technical 
um, nuance that goes into hitting a golf ball. But anyone who's played golf will tell you that when you're thinking about these things as you're swinging, it's usually going to end up in a very terrible outcome. And the best swings are the swings when you're not thinking about any of these things. You're just thinking about hitting that golf ball. So, you know, it takes a lot of practice to learn these specific things and to cause a great golf swing. But ultimately, an effective golf swing is when you're allowing the swing to just happen. You know, the trick is to do less thinking and more doing, uh, less causing and more allowing. So for this section of causing and allowing, um, you know, when I say it's all in your head and it's get out of your head in the first part, for this part, I'm saying it's, you know, it's really up to you. Uh, you have to cause things to happen, but at the same time, it's not up to you. Um, you have to allow things to happen. So I have another quote, and this one's from a very famous um, person, uh, you know, psychologist. Uh, not really. It's um, I'll tell you the quote, then I'll tell you who said it. So the quote is, structure is like the sides of the river. In order for the river to flow, you have to have these sides. Otherwise, the river would just spread out and evaporate. Whenever you introduce structure, your energy can flow. So th the context of this quote was, um, it was in Yoga Journal, and they were talking to people about how do they fit in their yoga practice when they don't have like a regular routine. And so this quote was from Jesse Carmichael, uh, the keyboardist from Maroon 5, and he talked about how he keeps <laughs> a, a regular yoga practice, and he talks about how the structure of the practice really allows for his creative energies to flow. And so what I'm taking away from this is that structure or causing certain things to happen, that structure allows for flow um, to happen. So here's a, an example. We actually all experience this every single day. Uh, we may not be aware of it. Um, and the, the, uh, the dynamic that we experience is the exact moment that you fall asleep, uh, you actually can't control that. Now, from a cause perspective, you can establish a, a consistent sleep routine. I mean, there's certain things that you can definitely do that will make it much more likely that you will fall asleep. I mean, obviously, if you're scrolling on your phone and you're listening to loud music and it's really bright outside, that's not going to be very conducive to your sleeping. So by following a consistent or establishing a, a consistent sleep routine, you can certainly help yourself go to sleep, but you can never really make yourself go to sleep. And um, there's this, uh, this, this uh, person who pointed this out. He said, you know, it's the moment you fall asleep, we actually can't pinpoint it because either we miss it, meaning we're asleep, or we're not asleep yet. And so you never really know that exact moment that you fall asleep. So even if you think about last night, like what time did you fall asleep? You know, generally people say something like, oh, it was around 10 o'clock or 11. But you can never really say, oh, I fell asleep at 11. 13 and 45 seconds, that's the exact moment. So um, every day we experience this dynamic of causing something to happen, but also allowing it to happen. Um, and the, the main thing I wanted to point out here is when it comes to causing, um, it, it really is up to you to establish these like diligence and consistent practices. Uh, so whether it's a sleep routine, whether it's a self-care practice like meditation or yoga um, or baking, <laughs> and the key is to be consistent. Um, you know, when I was doing my yoga teacher training, uh, people often ask, well, you know, what should I do? How, what, how can I get stronger? Um, you know, not physically strong, but just how can I have a stronger practice? And uh, our trainer, she said, you know, a strong practice is a consistent practice. If you're doing something consistently, you're going to see a lot of benefits from it. And a lot of times when people will start, let's say, a meditation program, they may say, well, I'm gonna meditate an hour every day. Um, and okay, probably after the second day, they're like done with it. Uh, instead, if they say, how about I start with a minute or five minutes? And if I do that every day, it's much more likely that they'll see a lot of benefits from it. Um, and the second thing with it, and this is the allowing part, is this concept of non-attachment. So even though I say I'm going to meditate for five minutes and it just, it goes terribly, I can't focus, I can't concentrate, you know what, that's okay. The, the point was you, you set that um, expectation and you, you did the practice and you have to let go of the results and actions, just like we established a sleep routine and we let go of the results. So let's break out into our breakout rooms again. 
And for just another three minutes, what I want you to talk about is, you know, besides sleeping, um, because that was the example we shared here, but what are other areas of your life where you experience this dynamic, uh, where you have to really put in some work and you have to cause something to happen, but you also have to just let it go and let it happen. All right, let's break up for three minutes and have that discussion. Okay, so um, Sarah and I were just talking about how this can apply in relationships and in parenting, uh, but what are some other things that you, you all talked about that anybody wants to share? Well, I shared about your river. I love that picture mm -hmm. because the two sides of the river are different, but I also was thinking about this structure and flow. And the more structure and the higher the sides of our canyon, uh, then the river, as opposed to evaporating, actually has a much stronger force. I don't like that idea, though, because <laughs> I don't like structure, and I'm not high on self-discipline. Um, but I'm trying to embrace, as part of this mindfulness, what about that concept? Would that make things actually easier if I accepted, allowed a little more structure into my life. Yeah, well, and, and you know, I think a lot of it depends on, on some people thrive in structure and some people thrive with little structure, but I will say that everyone needs some structure to their lives. So the, 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 the sides, the height of your sides of your river will really depend on whether or not you want a river for like, active sports or you want one that you can just like, um, you know, um, what is it called? Tubing down. So uh, there's different <laughs> rivers. You know, we, we all like to go experience different rivers. And I would say, you know, you're your own river and you, know, you can experience your own thing. And it, it'll change, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll change throughout your life as well. Sometimes you need a lot of structure. <clears throat> you know, I, I, so Sarah and I were talking about like parenting and, you know, you can take the, the, the hippiest you know, person out there who doesn't want any structure in their life. And it's like, well, you do have to feed this baby. <laughs> like, you know, like the baby's not going to deal with your lack of structure in your life. And so, you know, you have to adapt uh, for certain life situations. Great. Um, anyone else want to share anything? Yeah. I was, I was just going to say that um, if I allow structure to take on control of me, then I combat it it's like then i just like want to ditch everything but if i feel like if i move into that allowing myself to have structure instead of structure having me then i do better and also like if if i don't get some things done that i've structured myself to do i allow some of those things to migrate to another day yeah yeah, and we will talk about, so these, these kind of principles are what's let, serving as the foundation for this series. So when we talk about solo mindfulness, we'll talk more specifically about how to determine what structure is right for you and, and how you can practice these things. And then when it comes to working in teams, our social mindfulness, we'll talk about that as well. So, you know, these things are not um, um, crystal clear in terms of how you implement them. These are, they're just overriding concepts. <clears throat> All right, let's get to our third and final concept and this one's about solo and social so often when people think about mindfulness this is um what usually comes to mind is the so solo aspect of it so you know it's somebody kind of in in the midst of chaos they're trying to find their calm find their zen and you know this is great um for your intrapersonal health so uh, if you're talking about let's say emotional and social competence uh, there's two components to it and their self-awareness and self-management. And so what I would say is that intrapersonal mindfulness or solo mindfulness leads to character development. And in this sense, it really is, it's all about you. Uh, you are the only one that can really take care of yourself. You're the only one that can look at your schedule, carve out that time and say, I am going to take this time to practice my self-care. Um, at the other time, um, while it's all about you, the other thing is that it's really not about you um, because we operate in teams and we operate in collaboration and coordination with others. And so this is the interpersonal side of uh, mindfulness. Um, and the two, if you're talking about emotional and social competence, the two aspects of it that are interpersonal are awareness of others and relationship management. 
And to me, interpersonal mindfulness leads to culture development. So personally, you know, practicing self-care and, and, and the, the things we've been talking about that, that helps build your solid character. When you do it in groups and teams, it helps build a solid culture. Um, so let's break up into our groups again. And what I want you to talk about just for a couple minutes again is in what ways do you um, develop your character? And in what ways do you work with others to develop your culture? So character and culture, solo and social. <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's see if anybody has anything to share. Um, how, how do you develop your character or how do you work with others to develop your team culture? Any, any thoughts? I'll share. I, I'm an assistant professor, but I do manage people. And one of the things we were talking about is when, when people complain and are negative, and you kind of need to squash that pretty quickly and mm -hmm. make that not a normal thing within your team, because what happens, unfortunately, is they're looking for people to jump on board with that. Um, and the more you can get your people to not jump on board with that and make that not a normal expectation, the better. Um, and then the other thing that I think is important is if somebody comes to you and complains about something or any situation where somebody's criticizing or complaining and you hear the complaint, right? You listen to it, you, you hear it out, you, you justify the complaint and respect that person's point of view. And then my question is always like, what is your solution? And nothing's more frustrating than somebody who just goes, I don't know, or I don't have any idea. I just wanted to complain. And I get that people need to vent, but sometimes in a workplace setting, especially I need solutions to this problem you're bringing to me. It doesn't do me any good for you to complain and then just say, I don't know. That's very frustrating. Yeah, so, so we will, I appreciate you sharing and we will talk about some techniques and some tools to try to address some of these things. Um, one of the later sessions we talk about communication and then there's another session where we talk about teams and teamwork and developing those types of things. Uh, would anyone else like to share? I shared with a group that I basically just try to model it, both my personal character development where um, I'm extremely stressed, there's a lot going on and I notice that maybe I've been a little quick with my response and it may have been misunderstood as irritable or snippy to address it, to apologize out, not feel embarrassed to do so. Um, and then also in our staff meetings and stuff when we're all kind of catching up on things and how it's going, not being afraid to model you know, normalizing the fact that, yeah, I've been a little anxious lately or I'm feeling a little overwhelmed right now. I think, and Tramel, you know, I think hit it on the head and that just modeling that vulnerability can be beneficial to the work culture and of course with appropriate boundaries. <laughs> um, but that, that way it just again kind of addresses for real how do we help support one another so that we all can be productive. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I have many more things to share about these types of things, but um, yeah, the main thing I wanted to share about this was that, you know, what I have seen is that we tend to think of mindfulness as a very solo uh, or independent activity, but it can be a social activity. It can be used in, in groups of people to bring more awareness, more present focus, uh, more non-judgment non uh, approach to things. Um, I wanted to mention quickly that we do have these emotion. I mentioned the emotional and social competence uh, we have these inventories or so these assessments um, that can help you assess your emotional and social competence. Um, if you go to the OU library, we have these physical books um, on hand and they're free for you. We ordered some of them last year and we have some leftovers. So if you want to uh, get a tool to measure your social and emotional, your emotional and social competence, uh, just go over to the bird library and, and pick one of the, the books up. Okay, we have two more slides and then we're done. Look at this, doing great. All right, so bringing these th three things together. Um, these are the three mindfulness dynamics that we've been talking about. So um, you have mind and body, what's all in your head, but you also have to get out of your head, the Western mind and the Eastern body and combining these two things. We have causing and allowing, uh, it's up to you, but it's also not up to you, uh, structure and flow. And then we have social, solo and social. So. It is, it's all about you when it comes to development and uh, taking time to, to develop your own character, but it's also not about you because we develop culture socially. 
Um, so the relationship between our Western mind and Eastern body is, or our logical thinking, our somatic understanding, that's one dynamic. The relationship between structure and flow, uh, diligently and consistently practicing good habits while being open to whatever comes our way, that's causing and allowing. And the relationship between character and culture, how our inter interpersonal focus helps us care for ourselves and how our interpersonal focus helps us care for one another. So we're gonna build this course based on these three concepts. And um, as a roadmap for what's to come in the other eight, um, I'm sorry, the other seven sessions. So we're gonna look at, um, so this is the top row is what we've talked about and laid out today is mindfulness is this kind of progression of body, brain, and behavior. <clears throat> and then we're gonna look at this uh, from a solo mindfulness perspective. We'll spend just one session talking about that. And that really deals with, um, how do the sensations, the way you experience sensations, how do those translate into the stories that you tell yourself? Um, your sensations influence your stories and your stories influence your style, uh, your social style. This is a, a model, a behavioral model that I use called social style, but really what it means is that you exhibit certain recurring behaviors that are uh, traceable back to the stories you tell yourself, which are traceable back to how you experience uh, things in the world. Um, then we'll talk about interprofessionalism and some of the competencies related to interprofessionalism and the concepts. And then we will take a mindfulness approach and spend uh, several sessions talking about social mindfulness. And this is how, you know, uh, ultimately we have to first connect. We have to connect our bodies, um, you know, in terms of feelings and emotions and wavelengths and energy levels. We have to connect first before we can have effective conversations uh, and communication, and then those will lead to effective collective behaviors, otherwise known as culture. So, you know, our connection with one another will influence our conversation, and that influences our culture. One more thing, so if you wanna contact me, please feel free to reach out. I've included both my work and personal um, information here. If you wanna reach out, I would love to hear from you, <clears throat> see how you're doing on your journey to mindfulness. All right, so we will, we will meet once a month, um, basically every, every month until the end of the academic year. Uh, thank you for all coming. I would love to see you again, and uh, I hope to stay in touch.